think we had some sound issues last time. Yes, anybody hear me okay? Put me in a chat if I'm muted or something like that. Jake, how's it going, man? Hello. How you doing, Magdalena? All right. As promised, tonight I'm going to do some weapon designs. And I'm going to stick to mostly like swords and less I think that's kind of like a good place to start because there's a few little tricks and they're fun um, we'll just see if we can't come up with something good and uh, if there's something else like we kind of exhaust doing swords or there's just some cool idea throw them in the chat hey Carrie and we'll just go from there Probably do some axes, maybe. Do some axes. It's like a sword, but then shaped really cool. All right, so I'm gonna start off by just trying to figure out some silhouettes. And I'll start off with a trick, but then I'm gonna move away from the trick. I'm gonna start using the, uh, the symmetry tool, and that will allow us to get some shapes really fast especially with swords, um, but they can be kind of sterile, or they, they tend to look a little um, like knightly, like regal, things like that. Hey, Casper, Magdalena, are you still here? Sleeping dumplings, good to see you. We might do a gun. Guns are, guns are pretty involved, but we'll see. Um, kind of, I mean, I, we're definitely gonna do uh, weapons in like a multi-part situation. But if we do guns tonight, it's um, a gun for me is like designing one character. So it would, we'd probably get like two guns done. And I think I want to get a lot more done than that tonight. So, all right, so let's throw down a symmetry thing. And there's, each program has a different way of doing the symmetry. Sketchbook has one way of doing it. Clip Studio has a, uh, like a ruler tool um, that does it. Um, and you can set the number of sides of your symmetry, so that can come in really handy when you're doing mechanical stuff. And I don't know if Photoshop has one, but I have written actions that make it really easy to flip the art. So that can be pretty cool. And uh, I'm not sure, because I haven't used Procreate enough, if they, if they have um, their version of symmetry in there, but I would imagine it's a pretty robust program. All right, let's start off. So yeah, just sketch out some ideas. So, you know, typical sword. Nice long regal sword. And, but it, even though it's kind of boring right now, I think we can get like a base down and then have some fun with it. You know, like we could give it kind of like these these big hooks like that to make it real aggressive looking. You can see how fast with the symmetry tool it really gives you an idea of how the balance of the symmetry is working. Get a cool hilt going on. Weapons are nice because they don't have anatomy. <laughs> So you're not constantly wondering if you measured the arm right or anything like that. There is some proportion things if they're for a specific character, but if it's for the sake of like exercise or something like that, not so bad. And they're just kind of relaxing. They're the kind of thing where you can 
set up a page and just do a gazillion of them. They're a lot of fun. And we can do that, um, that like interlocking puzzle trick too while we're designing these, where um, you know we can let the in, you can let the negative shapes in between the designs. Uh, sort of dictate like what some of the next shapes can be, which can lead really us to some interesting um, shapes. So there's a couple ways I could do this as I'm roughing these out. I could put the symmetry tool on each layer. Um, one trick that's nice and clip, and I don't know if some of the other programs do it, that if you create a folder for your layer and you throw your artwork inside of it, you can take the symmetry tool and you can um, copy it and you can paste it on, let's see, I can actually, if you select it so that the, I did that wrong, if you select it so that the manipulators show up and then you hit control C and copy and paste that onto the layer, um, the folder itself, now it's gonna affect everything inside that folder, which is really nice. So that's a nice trick. Um, and so then if I'm working on a symmetrical sword or symmetrical anything, it can be a robot, whatever. As I'm adding layers and manipulating it, um, I don't have to keep adding that same manipulator and try and line it up each time. It's just in the parent folder. And then also like if I wanted to later on move this asset, this sword over here, it's gonna move it with it and I'm not gonna to have to reline up on every single layer where everything goes. So I'm gonna call this folder sword one and when we get back to it, we'll use that same ruler to kind of like build up more details and things like that, but I just wanna get some general ideas down. So I'm just gonna keep kind of doing that. I'm gonna create a folder for each one. I'll call this sword number two. We'll just keep doing that. So if you guys are wondering what I'm doing, and I'm gonna put the symmetry tool right in the, um, the folder itself so I don't have to keep moving it around. But yeah, it is really fast. So the roughs are fast. Detailing them is just as slow as everything. All right, let's, let's do something a little bit more aggressive. And I'm, I don't think I'm gonna stick with symmetry for too long. Although it's it's really like an alluring kind of like sexy technique because it's just so easy to get something really fast and really fun. Um, I think some nice asymmetry in these is gonna be really fun as well. This is this is our, this is looking a little aquatic to me. Maybe it has um, maybe the hilt is sort of crustacean shaped, so we get more of like an insectoid hilt or something like that. That'd be kind of cool. And what's nice is like it has these details, but it's like swords are cool because they naturally have like a really good um, balance where the handle and the hilt and the uh, the pommel which is this part down at the bottom. Um, they have like a nice rhythm of detail already kind of like built into them. So they, this is a terrible, play. you never really want to have a spike facing back up towards the user's hand, but whatever. These are video game characters, let's say they don't get hurt too easy. Um, But yeah, so the rhythms are nice on swords, kind of like a lot of things like motorcycles and they just have like these naturally built in rhythms which are really nice. So we can imagine this is like crustacean based. And we'll figure out the wrapping when we get into the detailing, but it's not a bad silhouette, right? So that's sword number two that we'll do. And let's see, let's 
do something that's asymmetrical. So for sword number three, we're not going to do, we'll still do the folder structure stuff just to kind of keep it organized. And let's do something asymmetrical with this one. So like, I really like broad swords. So let's start with the broadsword thing and let's see if we can't figure out something that we can do to make it a little bit more interesting because one thing about weapon design, more so than even character design, is just it's a really, really well trodden design space. So much design work for weapons. Just because I remember for every weapon that I did for um, Ratchet and Clank. Uh, the guns, we must have done 16, 20 designs for each one, rough. And then even when we were refining them, even as we were picking them, there's still a lot of iterations on them. They're just a lot of designing goes into weapons, even though they're, they're quick and they're simple and you can get some pretty cool stuff pretty quick. Um, so you feel like that would, that would speed up the process, but the process, because I think Sometimes when things are quick, you naturally just feel like you should do more. And it's a cool way to get variation in characters as well, um, where you can have the same character as an enemy running around. And if you give them all different weapons, all of a sudden it really helps to kind of differentiate the characters, it gives a nice silhouette change especially if they're dramatic enough. All right, so I'm gonna put like a hand guard, but I wanna do, I wanna do like a, I've not done this one before, I wanna do like a broken hand guard where it has a space in the middle. And obviously, God forbid, someone gets their, uh, the opposition blade gets in that gap. And then, oh, that looks stupid. Let's do, Oh, here we go. This will protect them. Put like an extra, extra separate blade, little axe blade on that. That'll be cool. You can even make that one sawtooth, so it's like really aggressive. Put a little cool mount on that. And whoever runs in, this person's gonna have awful headache. I'll give them, I think they call this Skull Basher. It goes on the pommel. What else can we do to make this thing interesting? Well, I don't want to change from a traditional, can't remember what that's called. It's not, that's above the hilt, it's something else. I'll just do it, we'll decorate that up a little bit further. You can see that once you take the symmetry away from the process, it does slow down a little. Or I slow down a little. Yeah, they took those, um, those Ratchet and Clank weapons took a, a lot of time. They were so much fun. I really enjoyed them. It was one of the first gigs that I got to do at this, um, with the studio. And I just felt really honored because there's so much going into those weapons so much about the game. Right, I'm gonna keep the front line of this pretty, pretty clean, but I think the back edge could be pretty fun. Maybe we could even, hmm, let's, let's do a reverse hook. The weapon the swords themselves they have like they're like little characters they just sort of start to come alive and obviously like I think we can get some like filigree designed somewhere in here we'll see how that goes all right so that sword number three we'll do a fourth sword and then we'll We'll move forward with these, and if we blow through them pretty fast, 
Uh, we'll do some axes, and if we blow through those pretty fast, maybe we'll take a gun on. I don't know. We'll see. Let's see what kind of weapon we want to do now. That's. Sorry. Throat's a little dry today, so I'm going to be drinking a lot more than normal. Mmm. So I've kind of, I'm going to stick with me, sort of medieval right now. Maybe we'll do something more futuristic on another stream or something. Futuristic swords are pretty badass. Do something kind of blunt shaped here. Do the guard. I think. I think I'm gonna mount the guard. Let's see how I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna mount the guard on the blade like a mechanism kind of thing. A little robot action, but medieval robot. So like these things could maybe rotate. I don't know. I don't even know if this makes sense. Maybe there's a gear mechanism. A little clockwork action. And I think just because that's a nice big broad shape, I'm just going to keep the pommel kind of simple. Blade. You can do like a razor blade thing. I do like this little kick out right here, but it, I just want like something at the end to kind of like tell a little bit of a story. Which, oh, okay, so which cultural civilization or era would you say is the most inspiring to you? As far um, as far as like medieval stuff goes, or would you say just like in general, like like what am I looking at the most? cut some holes in it so those are like trans those are just holes for weight cut through I think that'll look cool and then we'll mess it up and actually it looks like I could probably use the symmetry tool on this one to get the um, to get the handle nice and that way it won't look so wonky but then We'll do a little asymmetrical stuff on the blade itself. So it already looks like I put the handle a little bit too far over, as one does. All right, we'll, re we'll fix that all when we get back to him. Culture that just sparks my imagination. Hmm. So I'm a child of the 80s. So I really look at like functional stuff mostly. I'm a, I'm a huge nerd for construction equipment and for machinery, like really, really functional machinery, um, which isn't really a cultural thing, but it is sort of like, like I, I do like like late 1800s, early 1900s inventions quite a bit. I like the physicality of um, industrial revolution mechanisms, factories, and I really like 50s era machinery as well. Um, both of those periods of time 
um, like I, I really like the way that the engineers and the, the uh, machinists took the time to really doll up their um, you know the mechanisms they would add filigree they would add just like really art deco beautiful casings it was this photograph I saw of um, excuse me of a train I think you guys have probably seen it it's um, it's a streamlined train that looks like a bullet um, I'll just draw a quick sketch of one because I don't remember what it's called um, but it has it has like a pill shape front with a little light on it I think it has a ridge that goes down the back it's just like this really streamlined train and um, you know every single time you see a photo of it it's just it looks like it just looks like the future and what I find fascinating about it is there's this one photo of these me uh, mechanics working on it and they have what's essentially the hood opened up looking at the steam engine on the inside of it and it's this old archaic typical looking steam engine there's nothing really modern about it at all it's all about the exterior and how the designer made this sort of archaic device look a lot more impressive just by putting it in a, in a nice shiny wrapper I'm sure it was much more efficient than the old ones but All right, let's go back to these. So I'm just gonna work right over the top of these. So we'll get the blade. The blades will go pretty quick in in the um, in the inking because they're pretty simple shapes. But we'll spend some time making the the hilt's a little bit more fun. You know, you know, like if you're painting these, you don't have to ink them. Like if you're just like straight up painting, I just don't do a lot of that. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I, I, I definitely look at different cultures for inspiration. Um, and I think lately I steer away from it, from trying to appropriate just because of, you know, like everything we're learning culturally. Not everything is just up for grabs. Um, so I'm, I'm looking more at like more universal themes. And well, I think we're all trying to invent things that just have never been done before. But nature is the best. Nature is nothing but nice gifts. All right, so for whenever you have these like facets where the blade changes, not all blades have that, but I just think it looks way cooler is to make sure that there's like a nice hard break. So I'm just kind of like doing For me, I like I like the way that this looks like it's like filed shape, and it has this nice for games. Game engines respond really well to plane changes because then you'll get a nice little glint of light right where that like hard edge is, and it just helps really turn the form. But there is a lot of blades out there, sword blades that are much more smooth, polished around those edges, so that they just sort of like naturally go into the the rest of the meat of the blade. But I'm not going to do that. All right, so let's get some fun stuff going on with this hilt down here. I feel like it needs something up here. I don't know what yet. I'll come back. So these are just going to be sort of like abstract filigrees, I think. But I am trying to think of... Um, a little bit of functionality, you know, like this is, even though it's like kind of like a random piece of filigree, it's going to be functional, like it's holding on those those side pieces. Don't do it. Make those more 
this look like? Huh? And this is just the nice thing about weapons is they are they they can lead you to just practice like shape logic. You know, so if you want to play with rhythms and layering and things like that, it's nice to have something that you're you're not trying to also do a thousand other things like measure arm lengths and things like that. You could just play with beautiful shapes. So. We're gonna we're gonna probably nick these all up as well. So this looks cool on weapons. But before we go mashing them up, we'll get all the details going. So again, I'm trying to create some plane changes, and I'm a little. Let's see, I think we need like a center a central object. This is looking a little bit like the Thundercat sword, but we'll get away from that in a second. Maybe it has like a hollow in here, and then there's a stone. But that stone isn't touching the sword. It's a very weak sword hilt, so a real blacksmith would be pissed at me right now. But it's a magic sword. Someone's probably made a knife out of meat before. Everything's been done. So just by doing like repeating forms and the stair stepping things, you get you know, you get this nice illusion of filigree. For the wrapping on the, well, let's get the bottom design while we're thinking about that done first, and then we'll do the wrapping. So we can do the same thing where we put like a stone cradled. Because the blacksmith's already mad at us, so what's the difference? So for the wraps, this is looking like a pretty, like a pretty boy sword a little bit. So let's just do kind of like a standard. Actually, we'll do a spiral wrap on that, which means we have to turn the symmetry off. Just imagine a coiling. do the damage or anything like that until we get into kind of rendering it a little bit um, but I am gonna for now just while I'm already in this folder I'm gonna just do a flat I'll use like a deep gray or something like that I've already got the symmetry so I can do a lot faster keep that on there are tricks to using like the fill tools and stuff like that but something like this it's just as fast. She ended up doing a lot of cleanup anyway. But we'll use this as our um, to help us with our masks and you know doing all our flatting. So I'll do this after each drawing.
sometimes at this stage when I'm flatting, I find shapes that I should have put in. I'll add them and then I'll go back and do the inks. I think it's kind of like an important reminder that drawing this stuff to, is not like a one-way street. You know, just because you're done inking doesn't mean you can't go back and keep working on it or fixing things. I worked on a concept today that I I didn't even draw the head on the character before I colored the whole body because I was having trouble seeing the silhouette. And then I was able to get much better designs on the head once I understood what the silhouette of the body was. So you gotta just do what you gotta do. Don't feel like there's some rule that doesn't allow you to do it any whatever, you know, the needed way. So if I needed to like add something to this now, just go back to that layer and keep going. Right, so I'll turn the symmetry off to do this wrap. sword is in good shape. All right. <laughs> yeah, I Dark Crystal was a pretty good influence on me when I was growing up. That was a cool one. I love that stuff. I watched, I tried to watch the Netflix version with my kids and they just thought they just couldn't they couldn't get their heads around it which is why I even though I was enjoying seeing everything again I could tell that it wasn't gonna land because unless you grew up with it it just doesn't have it just doesn't have the same um, presence you know all the weirdness that's going on with the you know, the, the puppetry and things like that. So this one was the one that was sort of crustacean like. on doing like natural forms with this. interesting places to have the the blade edge turn so that we can have some fun while we're rendering it. Alright. It's nice and aggressive. Probably take some chunks out of these too in the blades as if they've seen a little bit of damage when we get going on them. character work done tonight.
uh, design stuff for the Ratchet and Clank, would you just come up with a bunch of cool looking stuff or would they be giving prompts or specific direction? Uh, it was both. It was both, um, depending upon what time in the project it was. And actually, um, as we got um, further into the franchise, um, we became very adamant about designing the weapons after the um, the sp uh, you know the actual design specs were nailed down. Um, an awful lot of stuff gets cut in video games when it's really really cool, but then it finds no place in the actual product itself. And Ratchet and Clank wasn't um, any different than other games that have run into those same problems. So in order to kind of negate things getting cut, we would focus on the on the weapons that were guaranteed going to be in the game. And then we would play with shapes and try and come up with things. Um, but we wouldn't we wouldn't land on something as an absolute until the game was tuned and balanced to a certain degree. Obviously, you can't wait till the 11th hour to do that stuff. But we would tune it as much as we could, work with the designers, get as much of the answers that we need to know that the gun was a good addition to the game. And really the best Ratchet and Clanks were the ones where the weapons were really, really well balanced. And and then the guns, what they look like, um, it just matters a lot more. So you get a lot more out of the design, which I think as a character designer is really satisfying. There were occasionally weapons that, you know, were a little bit more purposely amorphous designs, things that could be slotted into a lot of different things. And um, so you could just design a cool weapon and you knew that it was probably going to get used. And again, designing weapons was never like, I mean, it's a, it's a, the only chore of drawing weapons is if you do enough of it, you really do get tapped. The well runs dry fast, and it's and and you know after you're staring at pages and pages of designs, and someone saying, "Design more," <laughs> it's like, "Sorry, man, I'm just out of ideas," <laughs> and you're not out of ideas, but you're out of ideas for that moment. Nothing, nothing makes you feel like you're out of ideas more than weaponry. All right, so what are we gonna do? I think this one's got enough business going on. Nope, wait. I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna try, it might look terrible. I'm gonna try a sloppy wrap on this one. Which is just. Yeah, as long as we ding this up, it'll look fine been through a little trouble you don't want a sloppy wrap on, on a on a weapon that's supposed to look nice so just do the you know I always think of it as like mummy bandages where it's like just looped and kind of loose and kind of all over the place And you can, you know, in the concept, you can draw them, you know, frayed off, where like the, the wraps are coming so loose that there's like one sticking off like that. <laughs> but if you pick that up, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want that in the game. All right, so if that's. Let's go ahead. I like how I just like constantly contradict myself. Um, let's go ahead and ding this thing up so that it's, it's consistent. 
So I'm going to take symmetry off. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to start taking chunks out of things and weathering things. And um, just I'm not going to do too much cross hatching um, to show the standing blades of the you know the direction of the the file marks on the blade itself. But I'll put a little bit in. And then you know where these um, these nice clean grooves are. That's when you start go through and start to break those up. Like the sand, like they got dinged. Those high edges. If you look at a sword, that's like really um, those high edges where the sword, you know, where like it's in a, like a hard shape. That's where it's going to get dinged. Yeah, you're right. He does look like he's smiling. All right, we'll go back and fix that too. Smiling crab sword. No one's ever done a smiling. Sp we were the first ones. You're witnessing the first time a sword has ever had a smiling crab on it. This thing has seen some action, so it's getting chunked hard. And then, I think it, I think it probably hit the side of a crack in at one point. So let's put a crack all the way through it. That was like the last time the wielder of this sword would ever felt that this sword was actually stout enough to go to battle again. But let's just assume that his blacksmith perished in that same battle, and this is the only sword left, and it's imbued with power, so he can't give it up. So he has to make sure that he hits things just right. Otherwise, the sword could break, and all of his abilities will be lost. Right? That makes sense. All right, smiling crab needs to be worked out. They have like those little like mandible things. That's what I thought it was going to be. Still looks like he's smiling. Oh my goodness. All right, I'm just gonna play the fifth on this one and say once we render it, it'll be fine. Guess it could look like worse things. And you gotta be, I, I accidentally just set the symmetry tool on, which is what I just re, um, was, reminded me to say this. Like, you gotta be careful when you're doing damage not to use the symmetry tool during that because it, look, it, it ends up looking like features of the sword rather than actual damage. Obviously, because damage isn't gonna be symmetrical. I think I want to put a little like pearl in this one. Yeah, damage is the best. It does a lot. All right, so we can use symmetry for most of this, and then we'll go. Have, we'll have to go back and erase out our chips.
some stuff. I actually really enjoy flatting by hand. I used to hate it, and now I sort of like it again. Find like all the tools and tricks to fill things, and now like now I feel like I like it again. Where I like to like actually like hand fill everything. Just masochistic at best. All right, so now we can go back and start editing this. Yep, of course I did. I turned the rough off, so I should have done in the other one. Sword. Let's do the next one. All right, so this one's gonna have potentially a filigree on it, which is kind of my nemesis, but we'll see. So I'll, I'll tell you when you're drawing uh, big sweeping shapes from me. Um, you know, like I can sit here and I'm getting better at it. You know, as I, every time I draw, drawing like nice smooth arcs. But I'll tell you, the trick that I use the most is I draw it really fast. And I, I'd rather do a hundred really fast drawings like that until I find the one that's right, than to sit and try and get a smooth line by drawing. So sometimes I'll just do that, and that's my line. <laughs> And if it's a little bit off, I can either tweak it or I can just live with it. And tonight, we're just going to live with it. But the trick to clean lines is to move fast. It's got a nice like Arabic quality to it. Some beautiful designs. Alright, so then Oh I draw first. So we're Work on the guard first, and then we'll move our way up into the. So I'm not. One thing that's bugging me is I don't really like the tension that's going on where these two are arcing together, even though we have another arc down here. Maybe that's not such a big deal. Let's try it. I might go back and adjust that. the guard. It's always nice to make it look like someone spent some time on it. 
Another reason weapons go a lot faster. Maybe it's maybe it's obvious it's that we're drawing them in side view. Just drawing anything in side view is just naturally a lot easier. There's no perspective. And there's really no reason to ever draw something like these swords in perspective versus um, a gun, like a Ratchet and Clank gun, or almost, you know, you'll see a lot of concepts from military games and things like that where the guns are side views. Um, but it's tricky, I find it's tricky with, with um, guns in particular to to sell them to, you know, if they're the proper design, um, if you don't see them at three quarter, like you do a character, it's just so much involved, how far out things stick you know if i was doing a, a sword where the the hilt was really dimensional then it would be much more appropriate to do it in a three-quarter view so you could really figure out if it made sense how it moved in space and with guns with scopes and clips and all kinds of different things sticking out of them it's really tough to only do side view which is why at the beginning of this i said it would just take so long to do them because it really is just designing a character Screwed that up. That's good. Wasn't paying attention. Just have it so it'll get the sharpening of the blade will just be this nice false edge back here and then then it just we can imagine that it gets solid there. Oh the tension of, of like how these it's um you know I'll, I'll give you an example I'm just going to duplicate this and I'm going to go back to it. But like, you see this point here and this point here, you know, there's this, it's like a physical, like the, it's like two things arguing, right? Like you always imagine like all your shapes are having conversations with each other. Um, so if you want things to feel like they're in line with each other, you would have something more like that, right? So then now this, this path is clear. Um, and then if you wanted something that looked, so that's that's like a nice, um, a clean way to do things. Then if you want something to look elegant, you might have a thick to thin, so it's actually flowing. Again, like with the conversation, you know, if everyone's relaxed back out. Um, and so, and if you really, if you really look at this, if I were to, if I were to go even further with that, you could see just how like uncomfortable that starts to feel like you had those two sharp pieces of metal that close to each other. There's just this like tension there. And I'm not opposed to it, but it's it's what it's causing. Um, you just have to know what you want out of the out of the piece. But you have to you know, like anything, you kinda of have to know the rules before you can break them, I guess. whoever's blacksmithing the sword is being economical they're gonna forge the seat of these hilts together so this is this is like all design stuff back here. So I'm gonna see if I can make it kind of like we did on the first sword, kind of beautiful. So I'm 
just trying to come up with like a design pattern. And I hate that. So I'll try something else. It's a little bit more elegant, and then just to have some fun with it, I think I'll exaggerate. Kind of using the same metaphor again to kind of exaggerate that conversation, like everything's working together, and then everything's just kind of like flow, right? So this first one, I'm gonna start to break the form a little bit. And this next one, it's a little bit more elaborate. Think of it like plant forms. And then this one. Very big. And I just I like the idea of having some like mechanical fasteners holding that blade in. So I add those in. I don't want them to be too distracting, so I'm blending them right into the form. So, and just to speak more about flow, like flow is like if you want something to be beautiful, and elegant, and natural, the way Mother Nature builds things, then use those rules. If you want something to be ugly and clunky and, dare I say, human, then, you know, break those rules make things feel uncomfortable and you get a lot you get a lot of storytelling just out of the overall build style of that of that asset all right let's finish the hilt and then i, I am going to try and do some kind of filigree but i don't know i might even put it on a separate layer so that i can calm it down later my favorite medieval armors that I've ever looked at, which I think a lot of this stuff has um, a base in. And I don't remember exactly which museum it was, but I want to say it was LA County had a traveling medieval armor show a million years ago. And suit after suit after suit, especially the really, um, elaborate ones were just covered with filigree. Just this really beautiful, pounded in design. Some were just, you know, beautiful scripts, some were faces. I mean, it was just, it was just kind of awe-inspiring, just like how much work went into these things and knowing full that well that most of it was just, these were just decorative seats. Um, but then we saw this one um, suit of armor that was from the Middle East, from I think the Ottoman Empire, or something like that. And it was very, very different shapes. A lot of chainmail, breastplate. I can't remember exactly how the legs worked. Um, but you can imagine this thing on a mannequin. And then rather than having like all these little ornate I'll call them drawings, but you know, scrolling images all over the individual pieces. They had painted with a giant brush this giant piece of calligraphy, almost like a Japanese character or, or kanji or something like that. But it was an Arabic symbol um, that was supposed to give them luck. And it was enormous. It went over the whole armor, like just like this big swath over the entire thing. 
Yeah, absolutely beautiful. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. And it was it was basically just like a like a prayer or something like that. It was absolutely gorgeous. So unique. Alright, so for the grip on this one. No, I was gonna let's see. I'm gonna do scales on this one. Scales are when you plate it with both sides. And there's like a metal. Um, in this case, there's a metal. The continuation of the metal blade goes down through the handle, and then it's like riveted on. So this will all be wood, and so we can start adding in some sort of fun little details, and we can make this thing look like it's been around for a million years. Chunk up the wood. nice thing about doing damage is it's even more squirrely like you can just kind of almost like go with a pen and just kind of like push it around you still have to know where you want to put it but it's fun it's the, the messier it is sometimes the better it is but yeah I think it's like wood handle Almost want to have it a little gnarly in itself, like they found it and stuck it on there. That might be kind of cool. All right, and then we'll get some chunks out of this thing. All the things that it's collided with. The rolling edges and putting the chips in it. Cracks, but like more like micro cracks, I guess. Just kind of trying to make that silhouette just a little bit more interesting. that sort for now and then oh, I'm gonna do the filigree so I'm gonna do that on a different layer what type of filigree we're we gonna do let's do so we have wood so let's do something more natural looking I'm just gonna kind of use the form to help guide me and I'm gonna erase a lot because I, for some reason, filigree really gets me nervous. If you guys have ever watched videos of people doing like engraving on like small knives and coins and whatever mechanisms, it's crazy. It's like a whole different type of person mindset. I just can't even believe how detailed and steady they are.
Hey, have a good night, man. Appreciate you coming out. Minaj. I'm not in love with this filigree, but I think once some of the metal texture and stuff gets on it, it's going to kind of disappear. But let's call it that. I might change it later. Last but not least, our sort of semi-industrial sword here. So I'm going to start with the symmetry tool. Oh wait, I didn't fill it. Oh yeah, getting ahead of myself. I also realized the reason I like flatting um, by hand now is because it's a lot less intense on my hand. It kind of, it's like I'm still doing work, <laughs> but I'm not wearing out my hand as much as I do when I concentrate on the actual line work. So it's like a, it's like I'm justifying it by saying like, oh, I'm working, but at the same time, like I get to give my hand a little bit of a break. Hand fatigue is a real thing. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes you can get away from having a tired hand. Um, you gotta keep drawing. You just change how you're drawing. Like you start drawing a little bit, like with your elbow, and get it, you know. If you're noodling too much and you're tensing too much, you just gotta change physically how you're drawing. That helps. But flatting is a much more broad stroke thing, so yeah, it kind of gives your hand a rest. It's my PSA for the day. I'm going to ask a question now for later. Do we want these swords to be magical? Or do we want them to just be like straight up metal and materials? That's more interesting right now. It's obviously still going to be metal and materials even if they're magical, but I can have like glows and things like that. Or I can just do straight up pitted metals and things like that. Are in charge for a moment. I will say, if you guys haven't spent millions of hours doing weapon designs, one thing that you're missing out that's a byproduct is just you end up finding little shapes that you like you know like the end of this blade or something or this blade if I really liked it I might put it on a character and I didn't even have to do that much work to find it so these nice little abstract stuff it could be really great all right make sure I'm saved my knuckles, drink my tea. Onward. All right, we'll figure it out. So let's use the symmetry to get most of this done. Let's see, oh, looks like I can't draw a straight line tonight. Gotta draw slower this time. Okay. And then turn symmetry 
it off. I'll work on the blade a little bit. It's a little wobbly, but kind of looks natural, which is kind of cool. And so I think I'll use my circle tool to get some of this stuff going. That's the, if I'm too tired. Yeah, that's the other thing about being an artist is you gotta always just be used to being tired. That's why we look like we do. said it before but I go kind of quiet when I'm doing tech work so I apologize I done anything that's confusing that I can clear up? Is everything making sense what I'm doing? So I'm gonna make those side guards layer on top. I was gonna make them like inside, but I think I wanna make them layer on top. So I need to open this up again. Starting to feel like something. Uh, 
I would like that sword. I think just because we're doing the industrial thing, we'll do cross brace. It's always nice to mix up symmetry with like one asymmetrical thing, I think. We'll see. I might come back and erase some of that stuff out, but let's get a handle on there. I think the handle's gonna be a bit on the the wrap on the handle is gonna be a bit asymmetrical as well, but let's do a, just like a straight up tube at the end. I think that'll be kind of nice balance. This is like one of those like two-handed swords where like the handle's like a little bit too long. I don't know what those are called exactly. All right, so for the wrap on this, let's do let's do crisscross. Does that look too katana-like? Looks too katana-like. Do I know we'll do a different kind of crisscross. We'll do like bamboo almost. Still has like a an Asian thing going on, but Some of the best swords historically. I love katanas. Pretty though. Maybe there's like a couple of rivets or something in the middle of the handle just to. Well, just one rivet, maybe. Claymore? What's the Claymore? For the middle. No. I was thinking of a. I think I was thinking of an Asian sword that had like a really long handle, but maybe the Claymore has the two handed thing where they like you basically. That's like that big. Yeah, it's like a giant meat cleaver for killing people. No, oh, oh, whatever, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna be lazy and just copy it. Happy little sword. Now let's give it some character. Take a big chunk out of this one. Some fun with it, but not that high. Up. So like I I didn't really like design wise. I didn't like I want to take a big chunk out of it, but it 
if you put it right in the middle of the blade, then it just becomes really in your face. So I'm gonna always lean on pushing it towards cluster details like this, this hilt here and thing. Oh, you guys are doing the research for me? <laughs> but I bet there's a lot, but um, I think there's I think there's even a samurai sword that has a very long handle. Samurai. I think the, the blade looks pretty similar to a traditional samurai blade, but then the handle is two-handed. The stance that the user has is awesome. It's, it's like really cool, aggressive, aggressive pose that goes in the style of the martial art that whatever that's called, I can't remember what it's called now. But we can imagine whoever's wielding the sword is using that awesome stance. Like they kind of lean into it with both hands. I think it's like, like in, in some of the more campy movies, it's always like the guards have that kind of weapon. All right, we're getting shape. It's 1230. It's going a little slower than I thought, but that's okay. All right, let's start getting some flat color on these things. That shouldn't take too long. So we'll start with, so I'm just gonna be doing layer linking, which is um, when, I, when I just do flatting, when I link the color down onto the silhouette below it. That way I can just paint away and all I worry about is the internal details. So I'm gonna do the exposed blade edge in kind of a light gray. Massive katana. Okay. There we go. Massive katana. Seems like a t shirt. It's funny. It's like Swedish words where it's like they're very, very literal. <laughs> I always like that about Swedish. Oops. Wrong layer. Back to using the symmetry for a little while.
mostly this guy. So this one I think I'm going to go with a gold hilt. Keep this one on the traditional side. And then we'll just try different stuff with the other ones. So, when I'm doing gold, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I do start with a really dark, kind of burnt. It has to have some saturation in it, but something like that. But the problem is, like, the value of that color is so close to the gray that I'm not going to see if I make any errors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually paint with a much more chromatic color just so I can see what I'm doing. So I have the color contrast to help me make sure that I'm filling it all the way in. And then I'm just going to do a hue set on it to get it down dark enough so that we're painting up the highlights. I like to work on some, most things like metals, like dark to light. Okay, so we got the gold. And then for the wrap, do like a muted royal blue type thing. Again, keeping these all in separate layers because I can use these as selections later. Oh, can't use the symmetry. So I'm not loving this color, but I, it's good enough contrast where I can just make the adjustment later to something more to my liking. So I'm just going to keep going and then I'll come back and tweak the color. Color's fine, just not good enough. All right, so let's try, yeah, a little bit greener, darker. There we go, that's better. Okay, and then for the, oh, and then what happened? Why is that white? Did I not fill that? Silly monkey. Okay. Now we gotta do the rubies or whatever. This is a very traditional sword so far. We gotta do something about that later. Didn't layer link it. I'm gonna make every mistake I can tonight just so you guys can laugh at me. Alright. And then. Let's leave him like that for now. Okay, so that's sword number one flatted. Basic flats, like diffuse colors. We still have to do some like noise and beat it up a little bit. Okay, so for the crab sword, crab sword, what are we gonna do? There should probably be some sort of red, right? But I'm gonna go with like a deep purpley color. be interesting to see how this turns out. Maybe there's a reason no one's ever done a crab sword before. Okay, and then for the handle wrap, keep that one pretty simple. Keeping with the nautical stuff, we'll just kind of deep, like, deep dark color. Oh, I know, we'll do secondary color on the metals. We can just rub this gold, but make it more like brasses and we can tarnish it. That's what I like about nautical stuff a lot is there's always like that tainted, or not tainted, tarnished brass with like corrosion on it. You like that? Yeah, I like that. Okay, and then the pearl. Pearl's just going to be kind of a dark gray. Or a light gray in that case. Okay, so that is Crab Sword. Actually, I'm going to do a two tone 
red on that, so let's do a slightly darker. That'll look nice. And that piece right there. Okay, just a little extra thickness. So now for broadswordy. Oh, you know what I forgot to do is the the light gray on the small blade. I'm a terrible person. So I think I want to do like a wood and wrought iron, like some someone made this out of like old kettles or something like that in the middle of the woods. So I'm gonna use some dark grays for the hilt. Like it's cast cast iron, which means we're gonna have to pay attention to making sure that that is got some nice pitting in it. We'll get to the reflections on it. So all this can be cast iron, but I'm gonna chip away some bright metals on the edges as if it's been kind of like struck. It'll look kind of cool. handle we'll do like a, a wood handle and that's pretty saturated so calm that right the heck down that one's got kind of like I don't know it's starting to look like a Nordic vibe sword and then for this, I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna nickname this one Ste uh, Steampunk, but I'm not gonna do it straight up Steampunk. But we'll do brass again, so we'll steal from you. This one I think instead of corrosion, we'll probably do like grime and oils and things like that. Actually, I think the main bracket on this thing could be regular metal. It's a little light for me, but I need to be darker. I guess that's better. Okay. So we'll do brass down there, and then for the wrap, probably is going to look best dark, but it's so boring right now. What are we doing? Now yeah, let's do like a like a canvas wrap or uh, like a gauze so it's like and we'll just we'll just dirty it up so it's not so boring what's happening am I in the wrong way oh I know why okay. all right so that'll be our flats. And I know they're not like really magical yet, but that'll come. All right, so let's beat them up a little. So we just keep working back and forth. So for the gauze, get some grime on it. And this is a great time to have like some stamp brushes and stuff like that in your arsenal um, to get some of the grime in there. I'm going to hand paint it tonight, as I've said in the past. I like doing that, but this is a, this is a great spot to actually play with stamps and get some just like nice noise on there. I might do some of that in the swords themselves to kind of get more like a fractured metal. So 
So we'll get some like grease dripping on this handle. All right, and then for the brass. Need some sitting on that as well. So like the soot will build up around the rivets. Mostly around, mostly we're in the small machinery parts. And I think if we're gonna keep telling the story, we could probably do say that like the teeth edges of some of this mechanical stuff is actually getting little glints of wear where it's a little bit brighter. You know, like the ends of gear teeth tend to have a little bit of a shiny spot on them where they've been striking the other teeth constantly. Everything else goes dull. And then for the sword itself, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna try one stamp brush, or not stamp brush, texture brush that just has some crackling. Start there. I'm really just looking for modulation. And then on top of that, go through with some hand brushes and just kind of tweak things to get a bit more interesting. And then we, we can imagine that there's grease trapped behind these gears quite a bit, so there's just grime down here. drips coming off these holes for no reason other than it looks cool. Alright, so that'll be our machine sword for now. Okay, we'll go back to filigree boy over here. Okay, so on the pit metal, definitely want to darken up some of the the joints and down in the crevices as well. Get that story told. So I'm going to put chips in it, but I want to get the sooting done first. So I always go in reverse like that, where I actually do the dirt, and then I'll add the chips. Then I may go back in and add a little bit more soot. So now I can add some, you know, like on the edges of this metal where it's been struck a little bit, just put these little scratches. And sometimes these come across as highlights, but you have to always remind yourself that you're not doing highlights, you're doing wear. even though the highlights may sometimes end up in the same spot because they're the high edges of things. It's important to kind of keep your logic sound. You can see how much just that chipping adds so much. And then for the wood, the wood I'm going to just uh, modulate it a little bit so 
just gonna add some striations in some slightly darker and lighter colors make sure I'm on the right layer because I always do it on the wrong layer so this isn't gonna take much but I just just get some different values and slightly different saturations and just kind of go through and kind of like reinforce the ink work that we did again once the shadowing goes on it does all the heavy lifting so just having this modulation in there goes so far and just keep it like it's getting stained at the top here a little bit where it's like pretty dark leaching in some of that cast iron or something from being left outside it's got some nice modulation and then for the blade itself again I think I just want to I'm just gonna add a little bit of noise to it so we'll go back to I'm just gonna stamp in a little bit of noise and just get a little bit of wear and tear on it and then I'll go back and hand do it doesn't really matter what the noise brush is as long as it's just creating like those nice big flex hey Jason maybe this one has some big pitting in it should get us going for that let's move on to crabby sword so again just uh, I'm gonna start with the crab itself because I think that's the one that's a bit more questionable but I'm gonna just add some chips on some highlight wares not highlight edge wear where these edges are picking up glints of exposed metal from being struck. You can imagine that these top guards are getting struck a lot. where they're really pointy paint has a hard time staying on those areas too much so go ahead and just get all chunked off hey Kyle I know you were here and for the blade itself same old, same old. I think we're going to do the weathering on it again. Just a little something. Okay, and then I'm going to leave the wrap alone on that one because it's already pretty dark. It's not going to need much. Highlights will handle a lot of that. And then for this pristine sword, let's give it a little bit of life, right? Not too much. So we'll go. Well, that's already still too bright, so let's darken that. Sorry, I changed the color accidentally. Okay. So we can go a little darker than that and just give it a little bit of history. So I'm just kind of stippling and making marks and just imagining that the metal is mostly just has imperfections in it 
kind of set the tone, you know, like you see a lot of really polished swords and the fact that the metals are so pristine kind of makes them feel modern. They don't have any imperfections in them. So I always like to just, even if it's supposed to be a pristine sword, still mess it up a little bit, it goes a little ways. And then for the blade itself, let's see, let's try a trick. Let's see if this works. No idea if this is gonna work. I, I know how to do this in Photoshop pretty easily, but. All right, so I'm gonna use like some stippling. And I'm just gonna stipple up. motion blur it and let's see the angle to be sort of diagonal strength to be pretty long there that's working and it sometimes you have to um, duplicate it up and triple it up and stuff so I'm just duplicating the layer up so it gets really intense for a little while, we can always knock it back down. And it doesn't look like that blur is long enough now. There we go. Happy little blurs. So I'm just gonna create kind of like this brushed look. Just with these, and I'm just duplicating and just I'm just gonna add a ton of these until it has like this nice duplicated look. I mean uh like hand engraved look. Move those all together. A few more to merge. One more. And then I'm gonna put that behind the sword edge so it's just on the dark metal and go in with a hand with hand brushes and just kinda make a few like signature marks to kind of carry a lot of it. So that just acts as like a backdrop for some of these nice little like scratches that were ground into the surface. But then like the hand marks are the ones that are really doing, making the interesting stuff happen. flats done. So if we're going to do magic, <laughs> if we're going to do some magic on these swords, I think we're going to have to darken the background because effects tend to look better on that. And I really do prefer doing effects in Photoshop. There's just a lot of really fun tricks, but it's getting late. I don't think we're going to try to decide. Yeah, we'll move over to Photoshop. It's easier to use some of the filters and blurs and layer effects. All right, so this is already a PSD. version okay so yeah sorry about that so let's put a background like a deeper color and for drama smoke above it. Drama sells things. So, you know, hey, you want to sell an idea to an art director? Add some drama. Wow, smoke. go. 
That's all, that's all the drama you guys get tonight. Okay, so let's get some rendering going on. Sword number one. So I'm gonna use a consistent shading color for all of these. I'm gonna use a little bit of a grayed out purple, I think. No, yeah, we can always change it later. So I just have the mask on black, and now I can just start painting this thing up. So yeah, I'm just gonna keep the lighting pretty simple. I'm gonna imagine that the blade is being lit from left to right, whatever. Um, yeah, I can put these on Gumroad if you guys want. Okay, so. Jump in. This is, this is a good time to use selections too. So, like this blade right here is it's being lit. You know, I would say it's still catching light. So, maybe it's not completely in shadow. It's still getting a little bit of light. But these are perfect examples of when, like, you can imagine shadows coming down, and then just as it starts to turn back up, it catches some light on that edge. Rinse and repeat. starts to have the volume. What is going on with my mask though? Give me one second. Did I flatten it that bad? I did flatten it that bad. All right. Didn't show up before, but it shows up now. So let's fix that real quick. Oh, it doesn't have a mask on. <laughs> Remember that whole conversation I was having about how I like to prefer to flat things by hand? Also screw things up a lot too. But nobody knows it when you work on your own stuff. It's not until you decide to live stream your mistakes that everything falls apart. All right. I'm sure we'll have more mistakes in the future, but for now, let's update that mask, and that's much better. Okay. So. to throw a spine up the middle of this thing too. So I'm gonna do that. Okay. 
not digging how intense the, those lines are now. So I'm going to calm those down quite a bit. Back to work. So technically, gold doesn't really shadow. So we're going to have to pretend because it's reflective. So it doesn't really have shadows that it casts. It more it causes reflections. But I'm going to be a little bit lazy tonight, and I'm just going to call this gold dirty, and so it's become a little bit sooted, and so it does cast shadows. But any any reflective material like chrome or something like that doesn't cast shadows on itself, or it doesn't receive shadows. It just reflects light. So that's some quick and dirty shadows. And then do the highlights while we're here. So I'm gonna do my quick and dirty highlight trick where I duplicate the flats, set those to add and mask it off. And um, I can mask off the shadow areas, but I'm just going to go for it tonight. I think one of my light bulbs in my studio is starting to go, so if it's flickering in here, just, you know, it's par for the course. using my um, my flats as selections right now. So let's put some glints on this thing. Definitely losing a light bulb in the studio right now. <laughs> The way I normally approach gold is I'll straight up paint it, but um, it's really tough to do 
in a recorded, like in this kind of session, because um, you don't. I'm just trying to say here, you're. You have to get into like the reflections, and it's, it's a lot of back and forth, and it can kind of look, it can kind of become laborious to watch. So. I'm not gonna bore you guys watching me trying to figure out gold because concept is is sound, but it's not it's not fun to watch. But this technique is a little bit more immediate. So again, don't be afraid. Like what I'm doing here is I'm I'm overpainting a little bit. say like the reason gold is the various techniques of gold there's why there's so many variations is because gold isn't like a rendering technique gold is you have to you have to basically draw you have to look around at the forms around it and paint in the reflections just like chrome on cars and you see people who are awesome at rendering cars and doing concept art for cars like there's it's not like a I mean, yeah, they, they, they use the horizon and things like that, but it's, um, it's not just a, it's not like a creating a volume thing. It's, sorry, I'm babbling a little bit here. Hold on a second, let me make sure I get this right. I was doing this for a client. Uh, depends what stage I'm at. If I'm delivering the final, and this is um, intended to go to a modeler, then I would take it full render, and I would I would really take my time and figure out all the forms uh, so that they can hand it to a modeler and a texture artist, and everything is figured out for them. If it's the rough stage, uh, I just give some indications of the kinds of materials. You can do callouts. Callouts work really well, where you just basically find like a photograph of, of something that is appropriate for that, and say like, "Hey, yeah, this is going to be a vacuum hose, or this is going to be, um, you know, gold or whatever." And even the even the like the pitting on it, like you can do that, no problem. And as you get to know your team that you're working with, you know, you might work with a modeler who just doesn't need you to render things all the way out. But for a client that is new to me, I, I definitely render the heck out of things. A lot of, a lot of clients that hire for contract work are going to contract to um, every aspect of that team. So they're not going to be sitting next to the modeler. They're gonna, so the modeler is going to be working, you know, in their own home studio, and they're going to need every little bit of information you can provide for them.
It's funny, highlights are kind of the fastest part, though. They also do the most work. They, they really do start to make things sing. metal you can actually be a little bit sloppy in your marks and they actually look even better when you do that all right so I'm gonna turn this into a magic sword I'm gonna turn this into a magic sword explaining anything I'm just doing it what are you guys gonna do about it all right so I'm gonna start by illuminating our little rubies here and then I think I'll have to look like there's something kind of swirling up around it Is the Thundercat's sword called the Sword of Omens? Did I get that right? My old man brain still functioning. see why I wanted to use a dark background because this is this just all stands out so much better so I'm just creating kind of like the base it's glowing off of these things and I'm gonna go on top of that with another add layer add add and overlay and a lot of those layers they go really well for effects so I'm gonna start creating like a lightning side of that. And then we can go a little bit more intense. Certain areas. All right, good. I'm glad I remembered that properly. So anybody 
find out. I don't know my Thundercats lore. All right, and then on top of that, we'll just do a little bit of unifying for the effect, and then we're gonna go back and put some of the reflected red into the sword itself. Uh, what was I gonna, oh, yeah. So then we already know what color that is. So then I'm going to do inside the sword itself. I'm going to do an add, which is we're going to use this as our reflected color. So we got to get that just right. And then we can mask that off. So now we can start saying like, okay, some of this red light is starting to hit the gold in here. this blade and then because the blade has some striations and stuff we're just gonna, gonna kind of mess up that reflection a little bit that is too much a little wobble just to kind of give it and then we can just erase back down so it's not so oh, that's a hard eraser so it's pretty intense right now but it's not, not like I always like to work I like to over paint or over make things over and really intense and then just start calming them down and that's so abrupt the same thing. has stuff coming out of it. And then just because it's so tough, I'm gonna color the line work down a little bit. So, is a sword, right? Golden sword. Not real happy with the shadow color. Hold on a second. Okay. Just kind of, I just made it a lot more neutral. I don't even know if I like that, but when I come back to it. All right, let's move on to the Krabby McCrabs over here.
I'm going to darken the top of the screen just a little bit more. The effects show up even more. The darker you get them when you're using things like add. doing magic swords. Next one is the crab sword. Alright, so we're going to grab our shadow color. I'm going to duplicate that so it's going to look like garbage for a second. And put that in sword number two. start to speed up a little bit here now that you guys have kind of seen what I'm after I won't dictate every little thing until I'm doing something a bit more unique Tell my mask is bad on this one as well, so let's fix that. This is that point in the, the live stream where you guys are just watching me blindly uh, kind of fill in the blanks here. If you, get, um, if you guys have been working on anything that you want other people to see, throw it in the chat so that you guys are, can have a little time to get some networking going on.
Gone. If you got links to stuff that you've been working on, tell everybody. Now's the time. You'll hear me yapping. There's something. Starting to formulate an idea of what this effect on this one can be. Kind of experiment a little bit. Effects for me are very much like an experiment each time I do them. Just never know what's going to work. So if it doesn't work, you guys can just ridicule me publicly and we'll move on. Let's see. So ever since we made the choice to do magic swords, you can see I'm spending a little less time rendering this stuff because that effect carries a lot of the heavy lifting as far as like selling the idea of the sword. And we may have to go back and alter some of this stuff anyway if it's affected by the effect. <laughs> Let's get an effect going. So I'm going to colorize this blade a little bit. And I think I even want it to modulate a little bit. start building up like an internal glow
just like um, things like ears and stuff where the thin areas are actually brighter they capture light so if it has an internal glow it's going to have light in these blade edges a little bit more than in the central areas of the blade like where the crack is going through it's going to be letting out a little bit of light Just imagine this pearl is the source of this light. And I'm doing a lot of, oh, I just had a brush drop on me. I'm doing a lot of like stippling. And then you can use things like the smudge tool to kind of take your ugly marks and kind of do stuff with them. Just kind of mess things up. Whatever you got to do. And again, I'm overpainting. I'm going to go back and erase down some stuff here. Just want to make sure I got everything in. keep building up that effect. But as it starts to get brighter, we're also getting a little bit more specific about what is happening with the internals of it. So I'm I've got my kind of like global statements made about what the effect is and now I'm starting to be a bit more careful about almost drawing in what the effect is doing. Let's get this like internal dark crystal -y kind of like spirit in there. So I'm going to get punctured by a crystal thing here. Um, so now, of course, we got to go back with some of that green and get that reflecting on the crab itself, crab hilt. Behind it all, do a little bit of glow action.
some goofy little wisps. And then we'll just color up the line work a little bit and that will blend it all in to the effect. Magic Sword number two. <clears throat> All right, so let's get our shadow layer and duplicate that again. We'll use that for number three. Let's see how bad our mask is. So we can kind of hide some of that stuff. All right, so this one doesn't have too much crazy lighting going on. Aside, I'm gonna I think like do I do any sketching exercises apart from knuckle cracking to wake up? <laughs> um, yeah, I draw 
for a couple hours every morning that are uh, where I just basically draw whatever I want. I don't know who I was, was I talking about this last week, but like, I didn't realize how important it was, but like drawing what I want goes a long way to getting me able to draw things that, you know, are going to be difficult that day. Um, so I find it's really valuable to just spend a little time just drawing the kinds of things that are interesting to you and all of a sudden like you're just like in a better mood drawing wise so my warm up exercise like I know a lot of people like have like you know they, they draw lines and do arrays and color palettes and things like that I just I just draw whatever I want and just kind of mentally gets me prepared I feel a lot better about it it's not really a good answer, but that's that's what I do. All right. Just happened. So three. Oh, I know what I did. I turned on what? The two swords. Oh, that makes more sense. Sorry. I just figured out what I was doing wrong. I am all caught up. I had the wrong layer on. I think we had made a duplicate line work layer. Just try something else when we were in clip. I forgot to turn it back off. So this one, I'm not going to go hog wild on it. I think I'm going to try and make it look, because playing off the whole woodsy end thing, I want to see if I can make it look like it's like red hot. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it, but we'll see. I'm not sure it's going to look good. All right, well, we will just do it. Let's start with our bright red. And I actually don't want it to be dark. I want to multiply that on. I want it to be nice and dark. A little bit on the red, uh, orange side. I'm going to create a selection that gets me out of having to deal with the hilt. There we go. So now everything I paint is just going to be inside there. And then Removing 
some of that orange. Because the blade is thinner on the edge, that orange, that heat is going to travel down the blade a little bit on the thin edge. So we've got to remember that. That'll probably work. So right where it's meeting the metal of the blade, I'm gonna darken it a little bit so it looks like it's getting burned a little bit. isn't even as it makes its way into that metal. And then there's a nice, insane hot yellow. I'm just using a bit of a noise brush to start with. And now I'm going to switch to just a normal soft brush and just start bringing up areas that would be thinner and a bit more intense. The edge of this blade is going to carry a lot of heat. These little ridges. And we'll just artificially, it would happen to some extent, but I think the filigree is going to carry some of the heat down into it a little bit further. Because that's kind of cool. I'm okay, I just am concentrating. When I'm doing effects, when I'm doing mechanical stuff, I get quiet because I'm uh, trying to I'm trying to keep everything lined up and all that stuff. And when I'm doing effects, <laughs> I think I'm just like, is that how it looks? What do I do next? So you just gotta kinda put up with my weird silences and I'm kinda figuring it out as I go like you guys. All right, that is starting to turn green, which is bad. There we go. All right, this will be our kind of final heat. It's really starting to light up some of these edges. Do a little like smoke coming off of it and um, color the line work a little bit and it should should appear to be kind of glowing. Alright, so go behind the sword and do some smoke.
And on top of that, we'll do a little bit of glow. What happened? Why is that? Why is that set to multiply? Why? Hang on one second. I'm wondering why something's doing something. in the world. There you go. Okay. Whatever. Alrighty. Now we get a little bit of external glow going on. but not least we gotta do embers gots to do the embers nothing says fire like embers nothing says fire like you're on the wrong brush Fresh out of the heat. Well, we'll miss you. Have an awesome seminar that you're doing. I hope, hope you come back. Have fun. All right, last but not least, we got, what's that one called? I can't remember. Sword number four, the steamy, punky one. All right, so. I'm not kicking you out. I'm just saying, have an awesome time. My wife runs workshops and stuff like that. She 
always has mo help moderating those things. It's cool. Sometimes it's a cool way to get into some workshops for free that otherwise would be kind of expensive. Oh, I love Forged in Fire. I shouldn't love Forged in Fire. It's goofy, but I like it. It's one of those shows where you know there's a bunch of like legit blacksmiths being like, you're not supposed to go fast. <laughs> you're messing with power tools and everything's sharp. But yeah, it's really fun to watch. This one yet, so I'm gonna spend some time just rendering it up, and then once I decide what magic it is imbued with, I'll let you know. I didn't do. I didn't do any reflective light on that last one. Oh, and I screwed up the shadow somehow. Hold on. There we go. That's better. One second. I want to add one thing to the little flamey sword. Storytelling. Back to business. <laughs> Doug Markina. I felt so bad for this one guy that went on there and was like, if I hurt this guy, my wife's going to kill me. So his wife had like a, a thing for Doug and then he hurt him. He like, didn't build a good handle. Must have been a really, really rough night. Electrify this sword. It's gonna look 
the effects will be kind of similar to the first one, but I think I'm going to use like a blue. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Why not? All right. Let's electrify said sword. It's the last time I say it. Who knows? I fly by the seat of my pants. Good looking out. All right, so. I go purple. I can do purple. Purple electricity. Start with that, and then we'll get kind of grapey in the middle there. I aim to please. See what purple electricity looks like. You guys want to see a fun trick? I'll show you a fun trick that I don't do too often, but I it's fun to do. All right, so if you do, all right, we're gonna do the center of our electricity. This is one of the reasons why it's kind of fun to do. So there's the center of our electricity. And I'm gonna go a little bit brighter than that. Make sure I have that color selected. Come on, gotta get in there. All right, so I'm gonna use a layer effect, this outer glow thing, and I'm gonna set it to add. And I'm going to pick kind of like a purple color. So let's get that a little closer to our color. There. OK. Let's check this out. So now I'm going to fill the hole there, mask it off. And now I'm just going to draw my electricity. And the glow is actually going to be on there the whole time. That's what the ma real magic is. Sound effects for electricity. And I think our smoke from our other sword is getting in front of that. Yeah, it's like kind of cool actually. I'll just leave it. So we'll go through and make that primary bolt nice and juicy looking. The whole time that glow is getting generated by Photoshop's little layer effect thing. And then do like a little secondary little friend. Yeah, it has kind of a programmatic look to it, but in a pinch, that's that's great. Can 
the nice thing is it's live, so you can just keep going and adjusting it. So you can say like, I want it to be huge or I want it to be small. Take the opacity down a little bit. Just spread. Do all kinds of things. I think, can you do a dope? They just added some, some layer effects you can add multiples of the same thing. I don't know, no, outer glow is one that you can't, but that would be cool if you could. But you can use drop shadow as a outer glow as well. So you could do like red and then you just bring the distance way in, take the spread down, size it up. Just get like a little extra secondary business going on in there. Sure. It's just all live, right? So every time you make a mark, it's just going to update that. There. Electrified steampunk sword. Cool. All right. So the last thing I'm going to do these things, the background's kind of bugging me. I think we need to have a little bit more fun with that. I'm doing the thing where I'm going like way above, way overboard, and then I'm going to calm it down. So let's just see. I'm going to commit to those. And I'm going to work on them. I'm starting to make sound effects. I usually don't do that in front of people. sort of step on things in just to kind of get the presence of these swords to really stand out there you go four swords what is it five four score and seven years four swords and three hours thought i was going to be able to do some axes for you but once we get into the effects i think my brain was like let's do a little slower so that means we have other things that we can work on. But I know that people want to see guns, so we won't do another blade the next time we do. I'm going to get back to a character next week. I'm going to do a character render, and then I'm going to do a free draw again, because I like just doing the concept pages. And then I'll get back to doing weapons and props again, and we'll do a gun. And that way, um, we're not doing, just doing like blades. And then I think some of the other props can be things like, like TVs and computer equipment and things like that. I like really kind of cool stuff like that.
Well, the lighter values behind the lighter effect on number three, would it would, can I just show you? Like reverse it. Like, yeah, you'll see the smoke more, but like all of a sudden, like it doesn't seem like it's glowing as much. So just by having it on that dark background, everything like really pops forward. Yeah, I'll put this on Gumroad. I got it's gonna take me a second to clean it up just because I, I, I just kind of went for it, so it's kind of a mess. But um, like as like always, I'll just throw it up for a few bucks. And if you guys want to see it, dissect it, and see how the, um, I built the thing, it'll be there for you. And that'll be up in like an hour, something like that. Uh, yeah. You guys have any questions or do you want me to just get going and working on that stuff and then you guys can all have a wonderful evening. All right. Well, if you guys don't have questions for me, then I will see you guys next Monday. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate that very much. Sleeping dumplings. Sleeping dumplings. Is your name Kristen? Let me sure I'm starting to get that right. Have a good night, Jason, Justin, Magdalena. Like I said, I'm looking forward to you coming back. So even if you can like look at it on the phone and throw in one of your funny comments every once in a while. Oh. Well, anyway, sleeping dumplings. Thanks for everything. All right. I will see you guys on Monday. Thanks, Casper. Uh, what was I going to do? Oh, yeah. Like, subscribe. You know, the thing that people say at the ends of these videos, do all that stuff. So that helps me out. Um, Gumroad for this. And in the meantime, during the week, if you guys, if there's stuff that you guys want to see live streams on, like I still have to want to do it, but if there's stuff you want to live stream, go ahead and message me in, in, on Instagram, stuff like that. Be like, hey, I had an idea thing that I'd like your focus on. Um, and if it's something that's interesting to me, I'll do it or I'll just put it off for a little while and we'll do it eventually. But like if there's, if there's something that you guys are, are interested in, um, yeah, I mean, eventually we're going to start getting to stuff besides just concept art. You know, we'll get into like comics and modeling and all kinds of other things. But for now, concept art is really straightforward for me to do on Monday nights. Anyway, that's my spiel. I'm sticking with it. I will talk to you guys later.